Welcome, and thank you for joining us today as we all work together to learn how to navigate the many challenges and new normals that we now face every single day. I'm Carol Nash, I'm director of the Kids Healthy Minds Initiative, a collaboration between Franciscan Children's Hospital and the Archdiocese of Boston. Many of you are familiar with us having hosted our workshops at your schools, but for those of you who are new to us, Kids, Health, Kids Healthy Minds is a program that we created to help address the mental health crisis that's plaguing our kids today. We offer virtual workshops to help school staff recognize the early warning signs of mental health problems in their students before they reach the crisis stage. While well, our Kids Healthy Minds programs, you know, they all focus on helping our kids, we designed today's program specifically to help take care of you. First, I'd like to introduce today's three presenters. They're all licensed mental health clinicians from three different clinical programs at Franciscan Children's with different perspectives and areas of expertise. They are a true example of how we are all stronger together. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Fatima Watt, Director of Outpatient Behavioral Health Services at Franciscan Children's. Dr. Watt leads an integrated team of psychologists, neuropsychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers to provide comprehensive medical services to children and to families. Next up will be Maureen DeMilla, a licensed mental health counselor and our key presenter for the Kids Healthy Minds Workshop. Maureen also has a private clinical practice and she provides school-based consultations. And our final speaker will be Kristen Bagley-Jones, a licensed social worker and the program director of the Children's Wellness Initiative a Franciscan program that provides mental health counseling directly in 10 Boston public schools. Working with students in the schools makes it easier for children and their families to receive the social emotional help they need. And Kristen is also an educator. She's an adjunct professor in the Graduate School of Social Work at Boston College. So thank you for submitting the questions in advance. That really, that helped. However, half of the questions you submitted at registration dealt with help, help, helping others, particularly your students and their families. This wasn't surprising at all to us because as educators, helping others is what you do best. But our message today is that you have to take care of yourself first. Whether you are in a classroom, a conference room, or on an airplane, in times of crisis, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first before you can be of help to anyone else. While our presenters have worked hard to incorporate the, your questions into their presentations, please remember that today is about you and putting your well being first. There will be time for Q&A at the end, so please submit your questions um, through the chat. So now let's begin presentations with Dr. Fatima Watt, who's gonna help us understand why we are so exhausted. Dr. Watt. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Um, parents, teachers, and students are all experiencing considerable distress with the chronicity of the pandemic, the current socio-political climate and numerous secondary stressors. I for one am completely over the pandemic and living through historical events. I'd like you know to stop living in times that are unprecedented and just live in precedented times. But so much of what is happening right now is completely outside of our control. And when we experience a lack of control as humans in our lives, it can lead to stress anxiety and angst. Uh, I think at this point we can all acknowledge that we are un that we've been under a considerable amount of stress for quite a bit of time. So I'm going to spend some time talking about the impact of stress on the body and why you notice that you may be feeling tired all the time. Um, maybe you're having sleep problems, maybe you're struggling with memory and concentration, perhaps gaining a little weight, maybe experiencing some irritability and other mood changes. 
And so while some of this is of course related to your external environment, much of this could also be related to your internal environment, what's happening in your body. So when the body is stressed, it releases the hormones cortisol and adrenaline. So when you encounter a perceived threat, such as a large dog barking while you're out trying to take a walk, your hypothalamus, which is a very tiny region at the base of your brain, sets off an alarm system in your body. Through nerve and hormonal signals, the alarm system prompts your adrenal glands, um, which are located right on the top of your kidneys, to release a surge of hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol. In the short term, these hormones are quite effective in protecting your life from danger and protecting you from a predator. This complex natural alarm system also communicates with the brain regions that control mood, motivation, and fear. This is meant to be a very short-term response. Once a perceived threat has passed, hormone levels return to normal. However, when stressors are chronic, and again, we're all under chronic stress right now at this point, the alarm system stays activated, which causes an overexposure to cortisol and other stress hormones. And that, that really does have a profound impact on our mind and it interrupts almost all of our body's natural processes. Next slide. So if you look at this slide, um, when your body is exposed to cortisol and other stress hormones, you may experience um, some, all, a few of these things that are on the list. Um, we are at increased risk for health problems, anxiety, depression, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep problems, weight gain, and memory and concentration impairment. So if you're wondering why you're feeling off, you're exhausted all the time, distractible, unmotivated, it may not just be you responding to your external environment, but it may be the response that your internal body is having as well. Next slide. I also want to just say a few quick words about the impact of grief. The pandemic has taken so much away from us. Our routines, our social supports, our friendships. Some of us have lost loved ones or we've been sickened ourselves and have been concerned about our, our own preservation. And with all of that comes grief. So I'm not gonna go through the stages of grief in detail, but I just wanted you to see all of the emotions that you may be experience, experiencing in response to grief. Feeling sad, anxious, angry, tired, overwhelmed, defeated, frustrated, with all of these feelings vacillating from day to day. <laughs> and if it's me, my life, it's actually hour to hour, not even day to day. So all of this, is really important to keep in mind as we're interacting with one another, with parents and with students. Our baselines have certainly shifted and more kindness, compassion, and understanding are needed to both our, for both ourselves and for others. As caregivers, educators tend to be really bad at taking care of their own basic needs. And I know everyone is really sick about hearing um, the word self-care, but I'm gonna say it anyway, even if you're all rolling your eyes at me. I cannot stress enough the importance of at least taking care of your basic needs, including healthy eating to keep your tanks full and getting enough sleep to recharge. Next slide. So in regards to sleep, I asked my sleep expert for his top three tips for getting a good night's sleep. And this is what he said. Your bed is for sleeping only and sex is okay too. That's all right to have in your bed, but no work and no studying in bed as this will result in your bed being associated with activity rather than rest and relaxation. Create a consistent routine each night with calm activities before bed and no more than an hour difference between weekday and weekend schedules. Having a routine also mm -hmm. introduces predi predi predictability <laughs> into our lives, which is helpful in reducing anxiety and distress. Eliminate screen time one to two hours before bed. Again, I know that we're living in a pandemic and I know that this is something that is extremely hard to do, but it is so worthwhile for you to disconnect from the screen, to get away from that blue light and to give your brain time to settle and prepare for rest. Um, I've included the following website to check out. Um, I think that it's a really good resource. It will tell you um, approximately how many hours of sleep you should be getting a night so that you know, am I on track? Am I close or am I really far off? Um, and it also provides additional resources for sleep. 
Um, and if you're really struggling with your sleep and it's impacting your day and impacting your ability to function, consulting with a sleep expert um, may be really helpful to you. Next slide. Um, so let's assume that you are eating well and you are sleeping relatively well, which means that you are taking care of your physical body as much as you can. Um, and you know, adding in a little bit of physical activity where you can is always an added bonus. Um, but how do we take care of our emotional selves and cope with feeling constantly overwhelmed or extremely exhausted even after a very small amount of activity? I know these days it doesn't take much for me to be like, whoo, I'm all done for the day, that's it. <laughs> Um, so a couple of suggestions, recognize that you are not alone right now, um, and how you're feeling and give yourself room to acknowledge that life is different right now. It is a crappy situation and some days will be tough and that is okay. We have a new baseline acceptance. However, does not mean giving up. It means not resisting or fighting the new reality so that you can apply your energy elsewhere. Be cognizant of the issues that are completely outside of your concern. I know that so many of you are worried about your students, are worried about their safety. You're wondering if they're being properly supported at home. Um, you're wondering if they have enough to eat, if they have a bed to sleep in. Um, and all of that worry can become truly paralyzing. So try not to spend your energy on things that are outside of your control so that you can better apply your energy to things that are within your control. In a moment where you are feeling overwhelmed, try to pinpoint the primary source of your angst. What one or two things can you address that will alleviate some of your distress? When we can pinpoint the source, even if it's a, a really small thing, we are better able to strategize and problem solve, which again, puts the ball back in our court. It gives us control. Set boundaries on your time and work. Once again, I know that you guys are all rolling your eyes at me. But speaking from, and speaking from personal experience, I know that this can be incredibly difficult, but in the context of COVID and all that's going on, we have to remember that this really is a marathon and not a sprint. Setting boundaries might look like boxing out the hours you spend on a task or project, leaving or stopping work by a certain time, or saying no to specific types of work. This is also true for your personal life, not just for your work life. Setting limits and being clear about the commitments that you're comfortable engaging in and those that you are not is a really helpful thing to do with the people that you with the people that are in your life. I realize I'm talking to a room full of educators, but now is the time to let go of perfectionism. Recognize when good is good enough and that it is no longer productive to spend more time and energy on a particular task. It's a really good time to expect less from yourself. We have to provide ourselves with opportunities to replenish more. No one can function at full capacity with everything that we have going on. So many of our support systems are limited, whether that be church, community organizations, schools, and other systems that we've come to rely on. We have to recognize that we're all grieving multiple losses while also managing a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty. We need to show ourselves self-compassion and teach the children that we work with to do, this, to do the same. From a young age, we're all taught how to be a good friend to other people, how to be kind to other people, but we're actually not really taught how to be kind to ourselves and how to be compassionate to ourselves. I think this is a really good time for us to learn that lesson and to teach the young ones that we're working with also about self-compassion. Take moments to breathe and to stay focused on the present moment. Mindfulness can be a really great tool for this, but you do not have to carve out extended time, plan it and plan in advance, or even purchase a fancy app. Mindfulness is really about being in the present moment, noticing what thoughts come and go, but drawing your attention back to the present. You can do this by staring out, out of the window and noticing what sounds you hear, by focusing on the sound of the kettle when you're making tea or warming up food in the microwave, while taking a few deep breaths, really enjoying that game of tic-tac-toe that you're playing with your child and really focusing on the sound of their laughter. Um, anything that you can do to, to enjoy that present moment and to stay focused in that present moment. Beauty is everywhere. And we just have to open our eyes and ears to take it all in. 
really taking those few moments can be truly critical in reducing overall levels of stress. Um, and before I part, the last thing that I wanna say is it is really okay to seek help. It is okay to not be okay right now. And if you are struggling, if your sleep is disrupted, if your mood is disruptive, if you're just feeling off and not like yourself, it is okay to reach out for professional help. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness, it is a sign of strength. And so for all of you educators and caregivers out there, um, it is okay to take care of yourself. And if that means getting support from a professional, that is absolutely okay. And I highly encourage it. Um, so thank you all for your time. Thank you, Fatima. That, that was excellent. And I, I, Dr. Watt has so much knowledge in this area. And, and as I said, they work with children and families. And she clearly knows from her colleagues, from her patients and her family. Um, we, we are all in this together and it's not easy for anyone. And I, it's amazing that we just got through without seeing any of Dr. Fatima's children join us. Dr. Watt's kids join us. Thank goodness for the babysitter. Yes. Okay. Our next speaker is Maureen DeMilla, who is going to speak with us on a really important topic, how we're better together. Maureen? Thank you so much, Carol. I appreciate it. And I want to thank all of you who have, who have decided to join us today. I really appreciate your, appreciate your presence here. And I also want to thank you for the commitment that you have to your students and to your schools. Um, as Carol said early on in my introduction, part of my job is I do consultation work with some schools. And two days a week, I have the privilege of being in a school with teachers and administrators. So I have firsthand knowledge of how difficult it is during this time as I watch teachers struggle with in-person students and some, some of their students that are doing remote learning as they look towards their classroom and then down at the laptop and, and back and forth and trying to balance that. It's a whole new way of being a teacher. So hopefully I can be able to help you um, the way Dr. Watt did just now with some of her suggestions. Um, during a crisis time, Relationships with our coworkers can become frayed or even conflictual. This can lead to um, less effective performance, lack of trust, and perhaps even low morale. That being said, it's vital that if we wish to be part of a supportive and productive team, we need to address these challenges. And this can take some courage, especially if we have to talk to administrators or fellow colleagues. Allowing ourselves to be vulnerable can be particularly difficult for stressed teachers already with their guards up against physical and emotional harm. Yet embracing vulnerability may be just the thing to help teachers feel better. Respectful communication is essential to coming to an agreement about how to return to collaborating together and how to create a supportive work environment. I find it helpful when I have to confront something like that or when I feel some conflict, I, help, I find it helpful to use a skill that I find found in dialectical behavior therapy. It's called the STOP skill, S-T-O-P. The S is for slow down. The T is for think. The O is for observe, as Dr. Watch just talked about mindfulness, getting to know what's happening right here and now. And the P is for proceed mindfully or proceed positively. That's a skill that takes some time to just slow things down, especially when we're trying to balance so much. Worries and frustrations can lead to arguments or lack of cooperation between team members. But if we slow down and we assess the situation, we can avoid the discomfort. When trying to identify gaps or challenges of working together, I like to ask, what are we doing that's working well? What are our strengths? Identify those strengths. Secondly, worry, what are we worried about? What are our concerns? Where are the gaps? And then lastly, how can we build on those strengths and decrease those worries or fill those gaps? While going through this process, I think of the, the, the old adage, honesty is always the best policy. It sounds cliche, but it's true. We need to have honest and perhaps vulnerable conversations with one another. It takes, it takes courage to admit and communicate about conflict, 
especially if it's with an administrator. And if you are an administrator, and thank you for joining us, you also need to summon the courage to be vulnerable and share your experiences as well. Sharing experiences and, react and, and your reactions, this can build trust. It's important for our leaders. Don't, be, don't hide behind a role or unnecessary confidentiality. Obviously, some things must be held back. But if they don't need to, if you can share your own experiences, you really can bring your team together. Next slide. Positivity leads to resilience. This holiday season, I received one of those holiday newsletters. Some people love them, some people hate them. I happen to enjoy it because during the pandemic, I hadn't had time to speak with this friend as much as I normally would have. Her letter gave the highlights of the previous year for her and her family. The theme she had throughout the letter was silver linings. I thought about this focus and considered the evidence that seeing the positive or the silver lining can assist us in developing resilience. As you go about your day, look for the times when you can stop and relax your brain. Even if it's only for a few minutes, again, as Dr. Watt said, being mindful of what's happening right in that moment. I promise it will be a good use of your time. And if you don't make the habit of pausing once in a while, your body and mind might just do it on their own, whether you choose to or not. Mental breaks and relaxation help to keep feelings of stress at bay and reduce the feeling of being overwhelmed, as well as reducing the tendency to overreact. We want to make sure we respond, we think about things, we think about communication with others, and we respond instead of reacting. Reacting is one of those split decisions when our button gets pushed. But when interacting with our colleagues, we want to make sure that we are respectful and respond. We also want to make sure that we practice gratitude. Saying thank you goes an awful long way. We also, Dr. Watt also talked about kindness and receiving and being kind to yourself. But I would add, receive kindness from others. Make sure that, it's, it, that as you extend kindness, you also receive the kindness from your colleagues. Experience both the positive and the negative emotions fully. Next slide. One of my pet peeves during this pandemic has been the phrase social distancing. I couldn't disagree with that more because really what we need to do to keep ourselves safe is physical distancing. Social distancing is actually pretty dangerous. We need to make sure that we are staying connected socially. That may not be easy. We don't have the same luxuries that we had prior to the pandemic. Teachers are in separate classrooms. Teachers don't, perhaps don't have access to the break room and to get together the way they used to. But we need to make sure we, try, we do our best to try and stay, stay social. There are days when I'm not sure what to do. Maybe something's come up and I'm not sure of how to, how to um, address it. And at the same time, I have colleagues who possess certain skills and knowledge that I don't have. Well, as a teacher, you have two choices. You can either sail forward and pretend and possibly fail, or you can ask for help. And again, I build on Dr. Watt's statement of, of asking for help and not being afraid. I encourage you to ask for help and don't be ashamed to do so. Why not ask for help? You would want your colleagues to do the same if you could help them in some way. Normalize help seeking to decrease stress and recoup the time that you might have spent searching for a solution. Mm -hmm. The other thing is don't skip the small talk. That's not an easy thing to do given that we're not connected physically the way we used to be. We need to find times to have that small talk to say, how was your weekend? What are your plans? How's your kids doing? How's the family? This fosters connection and it builds trust as a team. Get together, even if it has to be virtually. Social connection is important. And I'm gonna use that phrase that again, Dr. Watt said, it's probably been used overused during this pandemic and that's self-care. But if, if there's any term that needs to be used during this past year, it is self-care and the importance of it. 
examples of taking care of ourselves can be things like saying no. Once in a while, we need to say no. We need to accept ourselves and accept others. We need to accept ourselves that we're not at 100% all the time and neither are our colleagues. If we have a list of priorities, and of course you have many priorities as an educator, you may need to trim it back. Say you have a list of 10 things you wanna get done, try and prioritize the top three and work on those. Consider staff support groups to enhance staff cohesion and coping. If you're an administrator, perhaps you can facilitate these support groups or actually conduct some information sessions so that your staff feels that they're in the loop and they know what's going on in your school organization. Next slide. And lastly, as teachers, I want to encourage you to pass your umbrella. And what I mean by that is every day you hold an umbrella, day in and day out. You're protecting your students from everything that could possibly harm them. You are their shield. The problem is there always comes a time when your arms get tired or your hands begin to shake. Continuing to hold the umbrella is almost impossible and, and it gets very, very difficult. It can send us over the edge physically and emotionally. Remember that it's okay to pass your umbrella so that you can rest and recover and ultimately take better care of those that you serve. If one of your colleagues reached out to you and asked if you could hold their umbrella, you wouldn't hesitate because that's what you do. You take care of each other and you take care of your students. So make sure when you need to, that you pass your umbrella the same way you would take your umbrella from your fellow colleague. And finally, please remember to be gentle on yourself. We are all doing the very best that we can. Thank you so much and thank you again for the commitment you have toward your students. Thank you, thank you, Maureen, that, that was excellent. You know, the pandemic, it's almost a year now and, and we're talking about the impact that it's had on so many aspects of our life. And to hear Maureen talk about missing the luxury of the break room, whoever thought we would have that in the same sentence. But it's true, the luxury of just having those daily interactions that mean so much. Um, thank you, that was, that was really good, Maureen. Our last but not least speaker is Kristen Bagley-Jones. And this is so important. Kristen is gonna teach us how to put our own oxygen mask on first. Kristen. Thank you, Carol. And thanks Maureen and Dr. Watt for uh, going first. Now I have a tough act to follow, so thanks a lot. Um, I was taking notes for myself when I was listening to the preview, by the way. Um, it's, it's very ironic that I am speaking on this uh, topic of self-care. I too am one of those that roll my eyes at self-care. And when my daughter found out that my part of this presentation was on self-care, she was like, mom, you're like the absolute worst. How do you, you know, how'd they get you to do this? Like, oh, point well taken. Okay. So this is for me as well as for everybody else. Um, next slide. So I know we like to think of ourselves as, you know, dusting off good old Maslow's hierarchy. I know we like to think of ourselves as at the top in the self-actualization. But I think what I've come to realize is that in COVID-19 and all the other things going on in the country, we're much more near the bottom. We're much more on the safety part of things and also the physiological pieces that Dr. Watt talked about so well. And our students are here with us. So anything I talk about or the others talk about, I think actually applies directly um, to our students as well as to ourselves. Uh, next slide. Um, so what I want you to think about for a minute is what's in your circle of concern. Some of you may have done this before, but just bear with me. Just take a minute to think or write it down on a scrap piece of paper. What are you actually concerned about right now? I know for me, you know, somehow I'm always worried about the gas in my car and I'm going to stall out. I'm, I'm below E right now and the snow's coming in, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but I'm also concerned about friends getting COVID. So I have a lot in my circle of concern, some of it minutia and some of it fairly serious. So just think that, think about that as we're going through the slides. Um, next. So, um, you know, we all know about effective teaching. 
uh, you all are doing it every single day. And so we know that emotions really drive what we consider effective teacher teaching. If your attention is wandering because you're worried about one of those things in your circle of concern, or you're looking at the snow and thinking, how am I going to get home? Your attention and your memory is going to impact what you're learning, let alone what you're teaching. It's the same thing for decisions. I know today earlier, I was in not a great mood and I thought, how am I going to do this? I was like, oh, wait a minute, back off, Kristen. Give yourself some time before you do that. Um, so all of these things are impacted. And who in COVID hasn't been worried about their health and well-being of themselves and other people? So all of those things are emotions that drive effective teacher. And I would venture to say, it's safe to say, all of them are being impacted by the current situation that we're in right now. Next. Um, so I thought this was a very interesting study that was done by the Yale Center. So they asked a bunch of teachers, I forget how many, you know, what were their main feelings? And in two, 2017, frustrated, overwhelmed, stressed, tired, but happy. Now look at 2020, anxious, fearful, worried, overwhelmed, and sad. And then they said how they want to feel at school is happy, inspired, valued, supported, effective, and respected. And we all want to feel those things. But if you look at the difference between 2017 and 2020, that's not good. So what are we all going to do together to think about these emotions that we all experience every day? Next. So I just want to talk a little bit about stress because I don't really understand why all of you are stressed. I mean, I'm 39 and I feel great. So, sorry, I just gotta have a little humor in there. Um, next. Okay, so what do teachers want? Again, from a study from the good old Yale Center for Intelligence, Emotional Intelligence, they want help, I want help, adjusting to the new normal of online teaching and learning. Uh, I remember when I first had to teach class on COVID back on March 23rd and how hard it was. I've gotten a little better, but it's still really hard. Um, how do we make virtual learning fun and engaging? Um, and then what they also mentioned they want is honesty, respect, kindness, flexibility, and patience from leadership. And I do want to have a shout out to leadership with your, you need to provide this for your teachers and who's providing it for you. We're all are in this same type of boat together. Next. Um, more realistic boundaries around working 24 seven. Again, another one that I need some help on. Um, this one I think is really important support and the resources to talk about social justice in class. Kids are really dying to talk about it. They want to talk about it in class. Um, strategies to support wellness and resilience, both for themselves and for their students and how to engage, motivate students. We hear about this all the time in my program. Kid has his camera off, kid isn't listening, kid has left the room and they wanna know how to engage them. I wish I had an easy answer, but we're working on it. Next slide. So, um, or I don't know if you can read the little scribble thing on the side, my, my Zoom is covering it up, oh, there we go. I'm a little stressed right now, just turn around and leave quietly and no one will get hurt. I think if we were in person, I could ask you all to raise your hand and say, you know, if you haven't ever felt this way, raise your hand and there wouldn't be one hand raised in the room. Um, so this was an assessment that was developed by educators uh, to understand their own stress levels. Um, it using, they hope that it would help us think about our own stress level, personal and professional, especially during things like COVID-19. And the goal was to help people appreciate the challenges at hand that will beneficially lead, will hopefully lead to beneficial uh, self-care. And that is the free assessment. I'm just gonna talk about it for a minute. Okay. Next. Okay, so if you can see this on the screen, I don't know if you can, I had to print it larger for myself. This survey measured four areas of stress. And what's so interesting to me about this is that students' well-being was second. First comes yourself and your, your own health. And you have low stress if you are, you know, experiencing uh, social distance learning has strong, viable support for your mental health and well-being. And then the next area of stress is students are engaged in digital learning, have access to materials, families are able to support them, and basic needs are met. And then the third area is the family community well-being. Love, your loved ones are safe, they're supportive, they can work at home, they aren't sick, they haven't died. Um, you don't live right in the middle of a big hotspot, um, and their community supports 
in your in your community for food, work, shelter, public safety, and there's no history of um, historical community trauma. And then the last one is the professional um, context. Your colleagues are safe, supported, engaged with each other, helping each other. On the district support, communication was very important. They want the plans from the leadership to be very frequent, consistent, and clear. We do understand though how impossible that is to do, given that every day something changes in this country or every hour about what to do. Um, school support or, or the district leadership, leadership teams at the schools, they want them to be providing time, guidance, solutions. And again, that's all really important, but we also know how difficult that can be. Um, so those are the low stress areas. And then if you go to the next slide, well, those characters, then you can see how if you're on the high stress level, you're in a high risk category for COVID. You have no experience in distant teaching like me. Um, you have, you're in need of strong, reliable support for mental health. Your students have limited access to technology. Um, most home, homes that are environmentals are not able to support student needs for a variety of reasons. Um, and few students have their basic needs met. So this is up your scale level, your stress level. The third area is loved ones have lost their jobs or they're sick or they've passed away or they're juggling an impossible situation of work. Um, and there's not a whole lot of community support um, and public safety is an issue. And then the last area is your colleagues are not feeling safe or supported. They don't have enough resources. They're sick or they've passed away. District support are infrequent, the communications contradictory. Um, there aren't outside learning partners to share. Uh, leadership teams are not and principals are not providing time and guidance. Um, and they're not offering solutions to problems. And then in the school community, uh, disengaged community, unstable budgets, which we all have, and significant historical community trauma. Um, so looking at the high, the, the low risk factors and the high risk factors, I would be very curious if you took the test, the scale, and see how you scaled yourself on it. I think I took it and I found it very interesting for me. Um, next. So self-care, here we are, all of us with the eye rolling. This is, I think, where my daughter walked in and saw what I was talking about and just laughed. She didn't get away from But anyway, um, so next slide. Self-care is fun. This helped me actually with my cynicism around self-care. It's not just go take a bath, go do yoga, even though those things are all great, but it's saying, am I paying adequate attention to my own physical and psychological health? Not did I go do X, Y, and Z, but am I paying enough attention to my own physical and psychological health? And I will admit, I'm not. Um, take, am I taking an active role to preserve, protect, or improve my own health and well being? Um, so it's the active role and the adequate attention that is another way, I think, to look at self-care. I think that's, I think, I'm going to work on it. I think it's doable. Next page. This is another thing that I thought was really helpful. When you embark upon self-care, which I hope we all will, think about these questions before you make, make your plan for what you're going to actually do. What are your priorities for self-care? Not what somebody else thinks, but what would you like to see? And then think about what are the strategies that have worked for you in the past when you were under, under, when you were under different challenging times? Um, when did, and how did you experience a sense of belongings and connection? And can you adopt those connections into the new normal? I have a friend I have coffee with every single Saturday morning. We have taken to standing in one of our yards out in the snow under umbrellas, chatting and having our coffee. Leaves a little to be desired, but Maureen, we're using one of your umbrellas, so it's a good thing. Um, what boundaries do you need to set and what can you be flexible about? And if somebody could find out those boundaries and let me know, I would, I would be really glad to hear about those boundaries. Next. Now, these aren't just things that I made up off the top of my head or I heard about. This comes from an article, Self-Care Strategies for Educators During the Coronas, Coronavirus Crisis, Supporting Personal Emotional Wellbeing, Emotional Wellbeing. So thinking about a new normal. How, and Dr. Walk talked about this a little bit earlier, but how realistic can we be with ourselves and be gentle and flexible? Um, emotions like a virus are very contagious. And you know, when you're with somebody who's very positive, you tend to get your spirit lifted up. And when you 
around somebody who's got a lot of negative emotions, it can bring you down as well. So just recognize that emotions are okay, but one positive and one negative can impact uh, people around you in a different way. I love this one, take a solution focused approach, not discount any feelings, but focus on solutions rather than problems to avoid analysis paralysis. I just thought that was a great term to use. Next. Okay, now, this one might not go over too big with the administrators in the um, audience, but I would share it with you as well. Reduce the workload for yourself and for your students. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Demonstrate compassion. When you start judging people, it is incredibly draining on good days and not during COVID days. When you wanna stay connected, how can you seek to understand versus under be understood by the other? How can you pull in understanding somebody instead of making them understand you? And then practicing reframing thoughts, you know, turn the negative thoughts into the positive. This will never end to, well, the end is in sight. We have a vaccine. Next slide. And then the flexibility. I think Maureen talked about this and I think also Dr. Watt for going perfection. It's really not that much of a problem for me, but um, that was a joke. <laughs> Um, trying to control what's not controllable, which we'll come back to, but it's exhausting to try to control things that are absolutely out of your circle of control. Absolutely. Take physical and mental breaks. I got to admit, this one made me laugh. Keep in mind that staring at screens more than 20 minutes is very stressful. Well, I don't know about you, but I've never been able to take a break at a job after every 20 minutes because it's stressing my eyes out. Think about that. This is doing a number on us physiologically, like Dr. Watt talked about, and monitoring your news, um, your intake of news and social media. How much are you consuming? Um, it's a lot going on in this country. And yes, we all need to be aware and involved and understand it, but it's a lot of information from many different sources that are coming in and taking over our mind. I'll speak for myself next. This is one that is really one of my favorites. If, if I don't laugh at least once a day, I know I'm not doing so well. Um, I really think we need to consciously ask for uh, humor and laughter in our lives and the, the release of those um, chemicals, whatever they are, Dr. Bott would know, when we laugh is a really, really important thing to do. When I worked in Boston as a social worker in my notebook I carried around, I would have a kid's funny comment, you know, those books that have all the funny things kids say, and I would cut one out and put it in the front of my binder. So as I'm walking around, I could look at it and give myself a little chuckle. Um, so finding a way to have humor is so important. This one's really hard. Having compassion for yourself, I don't know, but judging and shaming yourself has really got to go out the window, if nothing else. Um, and asking for help, as everybody else has referred to. You are not in this alone. We may be in different boats, but we're all in this. Is that the way? We're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Uh, it's going to look different for you, for me, and for everybody else, but seek support. It's really okay to not be okay. Next. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about students, um, because we all know that teachers are very worried about their students. So just a little example of how stressed out a student might look. Um, next slide. So I went to a forum in, uh, I went to a training in Boston public schools and I listened to this panel of students and I was so impressed with them. And these are some of the main points that I took away from what they said to the adults in the room. They want their teachers to know, this is a new way of learning for me and it's really hard. They want less lecturing and more discussion. I took that with me to my classes as well. My home isn't a refugee from the outside world anymore because they're in their home all the time. They don't want anybody to see inside of their house. Now, I'm not saying they don't have to have their cameras on or be engaged, but keep that in mind too. They don't want people to see the background in their house or people running by and what's happening. Um, social, we heard this a lot. Social justice matters to me and I want to know what does to you too. The news is really stressing me out and I'd really like to talk about it. Um, we've looked at a couple of groups of kids that have been studied, not necessarily in Boston, but they, said, you know, I, we, unless it's social studies, we don't ever talk about the news. We don't ever talk about the social justice issues. And that's something that's on kids' minds that we need to talk about. Next. They also said, this broke my heart. How, they don't know me, so how am I supposed to get my college recommendations? Um, 
And then another young articulate uh, person said, kids need help understanding what mental health actually is, and they need to know how to talk to their parents about their anxiety and their feelings. They asked, do my teachers know how worried I am that my family is gonna get sick or die? And then some schools have mentors, which is great, but saying, you know, even meeting with a caring adult for 15 minutes a week motivates me to go to class. And then the last one was having a teacher connect with me on a personal level really helps me connect more to school. And I think that's one of the most important pieces about engaging our young people is that connection. Next. So getting near the end, and I want to shift the focuses a little bit. Um, as these very wise birds said, we expert teachers know that motivation, I can't see my own slide, motivation and emotional impact are what matters. And what I really want to stress with us is relation, I, this is a quote from somebody, but I don't remember who, I'm sorry. Relationships and well being take priority over academic content and behavioral compliance. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, I know that that's not what your job is. But right now, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Kids do a lot easier for a teacher or a staff person that they feel engaged to. So I want you to just think about the relationships as being one of the priorities for getting through COVID uh, for kids in education. And then the next slide. So at the beginning, we talked about your circle of concern. And now we're gonna talk about your circle of influence. I worked with a teacher who was she was probably one of the best teachers I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot. She was so fascinated by this concept. But then later on in the day, she said, Kristen, I don't remember which circle am I supposed to focus on. She was so consumed by what was in her circle of concern, because that's who she was, that she didn't understand she had to you know, take it out. So I think that that speaks to how teachers are. They worry about everything. Big circles of concern. So if I were to say one of my circles of concern was driving somewhere after this conference, I would say, okay, what I can influence is I can get gas in my car so I don't break down. Keep coming back to that example. Or, you know, it's snowing out and I have a meeting outside somewhere. I have to get out there and get shoveling. So things like that. What can you actually control? What's in your circle of influence? And focusing on your circle of concern leads to burnout, unhappiness, frustration. We want to focus on our circle of concern. And then the final one, is um, you know, self-care is not selfish, which I have to be honest, that's what I used to think it was. Self-care is not selfish. So I wanna tell you is, you know, go take that nap, go make that tea, go play out in the snow, and above all else, go ahead and eat that cookie. Self-care is not selfish. And if you take care of yourself, then you will do much better for the kids in front of you and also for yourself and for your family. So go eat that cookie. I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. That was, that was great. Um, you have so much experience in the schools and I, I, uh, I felt that what you were saying was so valid, you know, for all of us, no matter whether we're in schools or not, we all need to practice what we preach. Um, if anyone has questions, now is a good time to submit them through chat. We have gotten some. Um, while maybe we're doing that, I just want to say that the Kids Healthy Minds is free. All of our programs are free and uh, we've been able to do that for the last three years, including today's program. And it's because of these people, all these partnerships that have gone out of their way to support us so that we can support you. And we are so grateful for our supporters. You know, one question that has come up is if I need help, you know, you say to get help, I understand it. Where do I go? How, where do I begin to get it? When we talk to the schools, we say, you know, start with the child's, the student's pediatrician. With the adults, start with their primary care doctor. But Dr. Watt, can you address that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, starting with your primary care physician is a really good place to start if you're in need of connecting with mental health services. Also contacting your insurance company is also a really good way to connect to services. Um, insurance companies keep lists of providers by expertise. If you want um, a provider who um, focuses on 
cognitive behavior therapy or who focuses on anxiety or focuses on depression, um, your insurance company can help you navigate through the waters. Um, so definitely PCP insurance companies, those are really good places to start. Can I add to that? Yep, sure. So another place that's good to start in addition to all those is um, the social work professional organization and I believe the psychologist professional um, association will have names of private practitioners and you can call and then look them up on site and say, hmm, do I like this person, what they specialize in? Um, can I take their insurance? So there's ways, it's called NASW in Boston. There's ways to get on their website and look at who they have for private practice therapists um, if you can't find one for your PCP or your insurance. So going to your primary care doctor, you know, right now it's all done through telehealth or primarily to set up a telehealth appointment, be able to talk about your feelings, how you're feeling, and they, they can also help guide you with what they think would, best, would work best for you, what sort of treatment you might need, what kind of counselor you should see, and they can also provide a prescription for antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents, if they think that that would be um, best for you. Um, one of the things when we were just talking about those resources, for everyone who has registered um, for this, we will be sending the link to this presentation to you, but we'll also be sending info about the Kids Healthy Minds Initiative if you'd like us to come to your schools, and we'll be sending a, a resource list for um, where you might be able to reach out if you need help. One last thing that we had all talked about that we think is a good thing to end with is an acronym that we have that is SMILE. You know, um, Dr. Watt talked about it. Everybody talked about it. Laughter is good medicine. There, there's actually humor practitioners who are out there. My cousin John is one. Um, and, and laughing is good. You know, they say practice laughing out loud. But so we say smile more. And the acronym is really, the S is for sleep. It's, it's first and most important. The M is for movement. When we say move around, we're not saying go to the gym, all of that. We're saying just move around, get up and walk around your desk, do jumping jacks, whatever. The I is for interaction. That social interaction is so important, no matter how you do it. We've even talked about doing things to keep our, our schools connected, you know, you can do a Zoom call and do a family feud um, competition or something. You know, it's not trivia that everybody has to have the answer, but family feud, go online and look, there's questions and answers. So the L is for laughter and the E is for eating better. Don't live on coffee and junk food, you know, try and have some nutrition, but please, Enjoy the cookie that Kristen should see. <laughs> um, we thank you for joining us today. Thank you all for participating. We hope you've learned from this workshop. We hope you've taken away something that, that is valuable to you. Be kind to yourself and stay safe. Thank you. And thank you to all the speakers. You were great. <laughs>